Entrepreneurial Edge is brought to you by Business Banking from FNB. Because small ideas can lead to big business. FNB, how can we help you? Welcome back to the Entrepreneurial Edge. I'm Chris Bishop. Your feedback on the show is always appreciated. So please keep those emails coming to entrep at sabn 360 Com. Now, still in the studio with me, I have Mark Hoffman, the CEO of the Lux Group. So, Mark, let's just recap a bit about what your business is about. I mean, you're all about luxury, luxury watches and luxury pens as well, which is a big thing. How difficult a sell is this at a time when a lot of people are turning away from that sort of thing and tightening their belts? Certainly, I think uh, we took over the business, I think, at a very challenging time economically, globally and in South Africa. and people stopped, definitely stopped their spend or cut back on their spend in the luxury space. So there's a challenge uh, with that. In many ways, it couldn't have been a more difficult time for you to start out at that particular time when, when companies were disappearing, people were just cutting budgets altogether. Uh, how did you deal with that? I think you're 100% spot on with that. It's interesting because a, a few people commented to me that if you can build the business through this environment, you'll be set up for, for strong growth in the future. So. Although it's challenging, I think perhaps it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it, it requires us to apply ourselves correctly and, and uh, you know, be tough and strong in business and get the right fundamentals in our business in place. So I don't think necessarily it's the worst thing that, that had happened this time in the economic climate. I said in the intro that um, your kind of goods that you sell are sort of things that uh, people, including myself, I've got two small children, that's my excuse, look out in the shop window, oh, that's wonderful, I'd love to have that. But unfortunately, we all walk away because the money is not simply around. I mean, aren't you finding that a lot of people, even who could have afforded it maybe five years ago, can't afford it now? Uh, I think the market that we're targeting in terms of uh, luxury, luxury products, specifically with a product like um, U-Boat, our, our watch brand, or Graham, our watch brand, or Montegrappa, our pen brand. I think people that are attracted to that type of product, Chris, they've got money in any economic circumstances. So I don't think that part of the, uh, of the market is, is as affected in these kind of times as maybe the middle segment of a market with maybe mid-market brands. It's uh, at the luxury end, wealthy people have always got money. And uh, if they see something that they like, they don't hesitate to buy it. And I can point out at this stage of the interview that a pen or a watch we're talking about here is the same price as a luxury car, you know, apart from anything else. Um, where is the money coming from for these? I mean, what would you say, just paint me a sketch of what would be a good customer for you? Um, you know, what sort of person are we talking about? I think in the, if you look at it, it's, it's, our brands are really in different phases and, and have different customer profiles. So I think a brand like U-Boat is appealing to a male orientated market in the 25 to probably 55 year old category. Um, it's someone who is successful in business or in the corporate world, but also lives life. It's someone who's got a sense of adventure and individualistic and a sense of style. So there's sort of a crossover with the brand between someone who wants luxury as well as a lifestyle appeal. And I think guys in that segment, that 25 to 55 year old market, if they've got disposable income, a watch is, is an accessory or a, a luxury item that they, that they desire. On the pen, if you look at Montegrappa and writing instruments, um, it's probably a little bit more sophisticated, maybe a more mature person. Uh, still connects back to people who write, do handwriting. A lot of people today don't even you know, never use a, a pen really, Chris. they <laughs> involved with technology so much, it's all about touchscreen devices. So I think that, that kind of product appeals maybe to a more mature sort of, sort of, sort of client base who appreciates, appreciates but, the more refined that, things in life. But sure, that's another issue for you. I mean, I was reading the other day that uh, people don't want to use watches these days, they've got cell phones. And again, as you just mentioned, with computers and iPads, people don't uh, want to use pens so much. I think certainly someone who's, who's buying a luxury watch isn't buying it to tell the time. <laughs> that's for sure. They're buying it to make a statement. Oh, well, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. But um, just talking again, though, talking about brand names as we just have been, surely one thing I've noticed, especially in the last few years, the brand market uh, is getting crowded. Every time I look into a jeweler's window, and obviously I look a lot now, you know, right? But every time I look into a window, there's another half a dozen brands sitting there. And I, I'm almost having to think, have I seen this one before? Where's it come from? Is it new? Surely it's a very crowded market. It must be difficult for you. Definitely. It's a definite challenge. I mean, it's 
separating your brand from other brands, I think, is, is, is the key in, in, in us being able to succeed in what we're doing because there are a fortune of brands that are, are available. And watches specifically over, over the last few years has become uh, more of a space where brands want to be able to play. I've just returned recently from the Basel Fair in Switzerland, which is the sort of premier watch event of the, of the, of the year where all the watch brands are on display. I mean, you can walk in there, there's halls and halls and halls of brands that you've never even seen or heard of. So it's definitely a challenge in, in being able to position the brand uh, correctly. And another problem, um, which I can see for you as well, is that fortunately brands are getting to be, um, what's, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, cheapened in the fact that there are so many cheap goods, clothes, cheap watches, good brand names most people can afford them now. Um, doesn't that sort of kill a bit of the exclusivity of the sort of stuff that you're trying to do? How do you, you work against mm. that? I mean, there's an element of that. And also there's a lot of, you know, as you know, fake brands that mm. come out of places like the East where people are able to buy um, a knockoff at 100 Rand or less and be able to w use it. I think the markets, if you position the brand correctly, the person, the target market that you're looking to, to that's looking to purchase the brands, understands what the brand represents, understands the heritage behind the brand, the integrity behind the brand in terms of its manufacturing, the quality that the brands are able to offer. Um, so I think that's the appeal to a consumer. Our job is to educate the consumer and uh, consumers and let them know what the brands actually represent. And that's, that's the only way where we will be able to, succeed, to succeed. And one thing uh, we were talking about before the show is that a lot of people who buy your kind of luxury goods, they buy them actually as an investment, not to wear or to write with, as one might think, but they buy them as an investment. Is that correct? Certainly there are, there are people that buy some of our luxury products as, as investments. Montegrappa, we've had uh, our writing instrument brand in South Africa only for about just under two years now and initially the biggest take up of the brand was by private investors, people who were looking to, they're either collectors, so they're building a collection or they're actually looking to to the uh, pens as a store of investment where they can buy a collection that's, uh, that's going to hold its value over time and hopefully appreciate over time. How is the corporate market looking for you at the moment? I mean I remember many years ago you'd go to these corporate events and you'd be quite interested to see what they were going to uh, offer people as a gift but in latter years those gifts have been a bit thin uh, how are you I finding it definitely i think that the, the the belt tightening you were alluding to earlier has been in the corporate market significantly in the corporate market over the past two years can you ever see it coming back um i'm not sure i think it's difficult to predict where that will, that will go um i think as maybe as economic circumstances improve again down the line when in a couple of years times maybe corporates will get back to that but I think there was definitely an overindulgence in that space for a while I'm not sure it will ever return to to quite what it was in terms of what how corporates were spending money. Another thing about overindulgence I mean there's all this hoo-ha now in the press now about bonuses and people living the rich life and it's not right when half of the world is struggling or most of the world's struggling do you think there'll ever be a point where people perhaps turn away from these things on, dare I say it, moral grounds? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't, I don't see that. Um, <laughs> and we were pretty, you know, we pretty... Uh, <laughs> no morality uh, just yet. There we go. <laughs> no, I think, I think if you've, you know, the, cap, the, the way the world is set up is if, if you're capitalistic and you're prepared to take the risks and, cr and create the wealth and add value to an economy, there's no reasons why you shouldn't be able to take that money and spend it on the things that you want in life. So uh, I, I see guys that are going to be making money, you know, they're going to be succeeding in business, they're going to want exclusivity, they're going to want to be buying items that, uh, that represent luxury and represent exclusivity. Now, guys making money, you just said it, there's a lot of them all over the continent now. What are your plans for the rest of uh, Africa? What are you going to... Uh, do? What's your strategy? Certainly it's, a, it's an, a market that we want to tackle. It's a, uh, there's, there's a, a vast continent and as you say there are a lot of wealthy people on the continent and I think it's just step by step. We need to build our base correctly in South Africa first and slowly then expand into other Southern African markets and up into the rest of Africa. And uh, where's the company going? What, what do you want to see? What, what's your future you think? Uh, I think um, in terms of growth, I think over within the next five years we want to build a business that's into probably a hundred million rand plus size business in terms of revenue. 
that would be the goal by probably 2017, somewhere around there. And you mentioned about your grandfather at the beginning of the show. Uh, when the next generation, do you think they'll, they're going to follow you into business? Well, my sons are four and three at the moment. <laughs> I think they're more interested in Barney than they are in uh, It's a bit early. In watches, a little bit early. <laughs> but I don't know, we always ask this question quite often on this show. Entrepreneurs, do you think they're born, do you think they're made? Interesting question. Um, I haven't seen an entrepreneur yet who hasn't been born, if I can put it that way. <laughs> you have to be born uh, at some yeah, stage. First, yes, yes. But I think, I think entrepreneurs is more something where you, where you grow into it. I don't think you're made as an entrepreneur. I think it's a progressive growth and development. You, you're always learning. You're always trying to grow. You're always trying to move yourself forward. Entrepreneurship is really about self-expression at, at a certain level and you want to continue to be able to develop yourself and take yourself forward. So I think entrepreneurship is more about growth than being made. So this finally when your sons grow up um, to an age, what will you be telling them? Live your passion. Do, do what, you want to be, what you want to do, what you're passionate about and never give up. That's the message I give them every single morning before they go off. Never give up and persistence. You need to uh, do your best every single day that you go out there.